As many of you know, my wife Lise and I are originally from Canada, born and raised in Canada. Only later on in our lives did we move to the United States, at first to go to school at Oklahoma Christian, and then later on, of course, to come and preach here and teach here. And eventually we stayed and settled and worked for this congregation, among others, and also took on American citizenship after many years that we were here. But when people know that we're from Canada and we're at this time of year, you know, Thanksgiving, inevitably the question comes up, you know, people say, well, do they celebrate Thanksgiving in Canada? Because they don't celebrate Thanksgiving everywhere. Like in England, we, you know, recently we were in, in London and they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in London or in Paris. They don't have Thanksgiving there. So people ask us, do they have Thanksgiving in Canada? And the answer, of course, is yes, yes, there is Thanksgiving Day in Canada. As a matter of fact, both countries shared an early pattern where it was a general day of thanksgiving and a festival, if you wish, for the harvest and for the home. As we know, as Americans know, here in the United States, this tradition was perpetuated for a particular day, the fourth Thursday in November, by Abraham Lincoln in 1863 and has been celebrated as such since then. Of course, this past Thursday, the 26th of November, was Thanksgiving, and we're kind of in the Thanksgiving weekend here. In Canada, however, Thanksgiving has developed differently. In the 18th century, it was celebrated in December in the province of Quebec, and um, it was celebrated in June by the rest of Canada. It's like if, 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 you know, it's like if in Texas you know, they celebrated it on one month and in the rest of the country they celebrated Thanksgiving on other months. Well, that was the situation in Canada several, well, you know, a century or two uh, ago. And it was celebrated as Thanksgiving uh, for the end of the war between France and Britain. That was the purpose of the Thanksgiving. They were, they were thankful that the war was over. And of course, uh, both Britain and France had a great effect on Canada because Canada was claimed at one time by both of these nations. So it, it affected somebody uh, in Canada at the end of that particular war. In 1918, Thanksgiving was proclaimed in Canada to be celebrated on the Monday of Armistice Week in order to give thanks not for the end of the war between Britain and France, but to give thanks for the end of World War I. And so there was a great, uh, a great uh, uh, festival, Thanksgiving, because of the end of that war. And if you've studied some history, you know that that war claimed millions of lives. It was a terrible, terrible uh, war. And so there was a great feeling of thanksgiving and relief when that war was uh, uh, ended and in Canada, uh, people celebrated Thanksgiving because of that. Then in 1957, however, this holiday uh, was set for the second Monday in October for all of Canada now, and it remains so until this day. And some people say, well, why didn't they do it like in November, you know, like the Americans do it, we all do it together. Well, it's because the harvest comes a lot sooner in Canada than it does here. In the, United, uh, in the United States. By November, everything's frozen over. So we're, we're not thanking anybody for anything in Canada in November. We're just praying that spring comes, you know what I'm saying? Well, whatever the reasons, historical background, or the day chosen to celebrate Thanksgiving as a holiday, both Canada and the United States have much to be thankful for and share common blessings of peace and prosperity that serve as a basis for this holiday. You know, Lise and I, we think this is like the best holiday. It's better than Ma Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever day it is, Grandparents' Day. Thanksgiving Day is a, is a wonderful holiday because it really truly marries uh, the, a, a spirit of thanksgiving that everyone, regardless uh, of their religion, everyone can participate in uh, thanksgiving. Of course, as Christians, we do not relegate our offering of thanks to a yearly feast. As Christians, we give thanks on a regular basis, every day, several times a day. And regardless of our cultural background, we share a common experience when it comes to the giving of thanks. In other words, I might be a Canadian originally, some of you may have come from other countries, different colors, different languages, but as Christians, we all share a common uh, 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 heartfelt gratitude for what God has done for us in our lives. So this evening, 
I want to talk to you about this common experience of thanksgiving by sharing with you three components, three components, three elements that make up thanksgiving. I don't mean the holiday, I mean the act of thanksgiving, necessary. The three things that all of us do, must do, in order to give thanks, no matter where we come from or whatever our, tra uh, our tradition. So how do we give thanks? Three important elements in the process of thanksgiving. Element or component number one is contemplation. Contemplation. Contemplation is the wellspring of thanksgiving. Without contemplation, there can be no proper or satisfying or meaningful thanksgiving. By contemplation, I don't necessarily mean the art of meditation, you know, for a better mind and body. I'm not talking about that kind of contemplation. The kind of contemplation I'm talking about is the focusing in on those things that are legitimate blessings in our lives. And then savoring these like you would uh, uh, hard candy. You know, you got soft candy. You get soft candy, you put it in your mouth, you chew it, you swallow it. But you get hard candy, you can't just chew it, you, know, you leave it in your mouth for a while and you savor that flavor. And even after it's gone, you still can taste the, the candy taste uh, in, your, in your mouth. Well, contemplation of our blessings is kind of like that. In Philippians chapter four, verse eight, Paul describes the type of things that we should savor, the type of things that we should contemplate in our minds in order to be at peace with ourselves and with God. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true and whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, he says, dwell on these. He could have said, contemplate these things savor these things. And by the way, he doesn't say it, but between the lines, uh, we could reread that passage and we could say, finally, brother, whatever is true in your life, whatever is honorable in your life, whatever is right in your life, whatever is pure in your life, whatever is lovely in your life, and so on and so forth, think about these things. Contemplate, savor these things in your, in your life. You know, we are disposed many times to focus on the negative. I don't know about you, but if I let my mind wander over the past, you know, what I've done in the past and so on and so forth, somehow, I don't know what, why, but somehow it, it naturally goes to something I've messed up. You know, something I've left undone, something I did poorly. If I just let my mind drift to that, I don't know if it's just the weakness of the flesh or sinfulness or whatever, but we tend to kind of naturally go to the things that we haven't done well, our failures, the annoying, the worrisome, and sometimes, of course, sometimes it's necessary to think about these things to try to improve our lives. But when we choose to review our blessings in the light of what Paul teaches in Philippians 4, we ought to be thinking about what is true in my life? Well, in my life, what is true, for example, here on, in this world, well, I love my wife, that's true. And all of the blessings that come from that love. And that love, what does it produce? It's produced this marvelous family, and, and these families have produced children, and, and so on and so forth. You know, just, just thinking about that one thing, I know that that is true. And what is, what is good in my life? Well, I could think of a lot of good things, but I'll tell you, after the experience of, that we went through you know, in London and, and so on and so forth, this church, <laughs> this, this church family, that's something good in our lives. And we were very anxious to get back to it. You know? Not just good old Oklahoma, it was great to see you know, out, the, out the window of the plane, great. oh, we're home finally and we're in the airport. We don't have to walk two and a half miles to another gate like you have to in Paris or in London, these huge airports here, boy, good old Oklahoma. From the plane to your car in the parking lot, seven minutes. <laughs> you know? 
So not just in this world in general, we need to, we need to think about the good things in our lives. We need to savor and contemplate all the good things in our lives in order to have a true experience of thanksgiving. What's the point if we just say, yeah, thank you, but we haven't, thank you for what? Well, thank you for my family, and thank you for my church family, and thank you that I have a job, and thank you that I can get up in the morning, Lord, and, I, and everything works, sort of, you know? Thank you for those, for those things. If we learn to contemplate often on a regular basis, if we learn to contemplate on those things that Paul says that are good and pure and true and worthy of praise in our own lives, then we, we set the stage, if you wish, for the next component in this process of thanksgiving. And the next component in the process of thanksgiving is celebration. Contemplation, celebration. Contemplation of life's blessings, of what's good in our lives, leads us naturally to celebration. We want to rejoice over the good things in our lives. The celebration of perceived blessings is expressed most naturally in gratitude and in praise. As a matter of fact, the words used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament translated thanksgiving meant more than just saying thank you. In the Old Testament, the word meant to extend hands, to actually worship God and express gratitude as opposed to lifting up hands in supplication. In other words, when we're, when we're giving thanks, we're lifting our hands up to God, not just to say, please give me something, or please help this person, as we do, for example, the blue cards, those are prayers of supplication. But when we're giving thanks, we're also lifting our hands up to God and saying, thank you, all of this. It's sort of like, I can't, I can't make my arms wide enough to hold all the blessings that you've given me, Lord. And so I just lift up my hands like this as a way to signify how great and how deep and how wide and how beautiful are the things that you, that you have given me, especially the things that you've given me in Christ Jesus. Interestingly enough, in the New Testament, the word that is used in the Greek, the word eucharisto, meant to give thanks in worship. Another interesting thing to note uh, is that the Roman Catholic Church, they use the word Eucharist, which is just an anglicized form of the Greek Eucharisto, they use the word Eucharist in referring to the Lord's Supper, signifying that it is not only an act of remembrance, but it is also an act of thanksgiving as well. If you listen to many Protestant uh, ministers, when they talk about the communion, the Lord's Supper, they often refer to it as the Eucharist. We will be taking the Eucharist. And so for thanksgiving to be such, there needs to be a sense of gratitude, and that gratitude finds its most natural expression in praise, in praise. It's not enough just to feel all warm and safe and satisfied because we realize that we are blessed, you know, it's like just feeling full after a great turkey dinner, that doesn't equal thanksgiving. You got to do more than that to express thanksgiving to the cook. Well, true thanksgiving does not happen until there is a celebration of that gratitude in praise. In Psalm 148, if you have your Bibles, want to read along with me, in Psalm 148, the psalmist captured this spirit in this particular psalm, especially in the first few, first few phrases, he says, verses rather, he says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights, praise Him, all His angels, praise Him, all His hosts, praise Him, sun and moon, praise Him, all stars of light, praise Him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. There is a, there is a man who is in full celebration mode 
praising God simply for the things that he sees with his eyes. You know, I believe that one of the elements missing in the lives of unbelievers is that they do not experience praising God and because of that are dissatisfied because whatever they do praise is so insignificant and temporal that it gives them no satisfaction. You know, movie stars, who do they praise? They praise other movie stars. They praise their director or they praise the, the guy who wrote the, or the woman who wrote the screenplay and poets and architects. You know, people who praise each other and praise just the stuff in this world, there's an element missing. The world makes no sense if we cannot go to God for comfort and expect justice one day for all of the iniquities of life, but it is also as senseless and anxiety producing if we have no one to credit for the blessings that we have not earned, have no control over or power to create or to stop. If we have no one to give thanks for all of these things, the end result is dissatisfaction. Even if we've got lots of stuff in our lives, if we do not know how to praise God, that stuff does not have the power to give us satisfaction. Why do, why do the rich and famous kill themselves? Why do they do that? Well, many times it's because they choose to party because of their blessings rather than celebrate through praise and thanksgiving to God. And so the first component of uh, thanksgiving is contemplation. We, we must contemplate the things that we have and think deeply on these things. And then we need to celebrate them before God. I, I think sometimes there's just not enough celebration going on. We try to do it here. The song leaders try to pick songs of a celebratory nature to lift us up and to encourage us, but that's only for an hour or two a week. What about the rest of the week? What do we do then? We, we, we need ourselves to cultivate within our prayer lives an element of celebration so that we can feel the satisfaction that God wants to give us because of the blessings that He's given us. You know, the things themselves don't have the power to give us satisfaction. It's what the things provoke us to do that gives us satisfaction. And for the spiritual man, for the spiritual woman, the things we have provoke us to celebrate before God. And that celebration leads us to the third component. And the third compon component of thanksgiving is contentment. Contentment, contemplation, celebration, contentment. Another element that makes thanksgiving a universal experience, as I said, is contentment. Contemplation leads to celebration, celebration leads to contentment. The celebration of our blessings in praise and gratitude is a major factor in producing contentment within our, within our hearts. Now, contentment is an interesting word in the New Testament. It literally meant to raise a barrier or to ward off an enemy. Isn't that interesting? To raise up a barrier or to ward off an enemy. That was the word used, translated into the English word contentment. The word was used to suggest satisfaction. It was used to suggest the idea of having enough. I raise up a barrier, no more. No more coming through. I'm content. Perhaps the idea was that we establish a line or a circle which serves the dual purpose of being a limit for our desire and a protection or barrier against greed and pride and despair. You know, God has created our bodies with a natural signal to tell us when we have consumed enough, right? We eat, and uh, I don't know all the details, that's not my strength, but I do understand that the blood eventually sends a signal to the brain that the brain gives us that full feeling. Okay, enough, no more. And usually the trick is what? Usually it's to stop eating a couple of hundred bites before that thing you know, locks into our, if the brain is saying, wah, 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 you're full, you're full, you're full, then you've gone past the full mark, you know what I'm saying? 
but at least it's built in, it's natural. God has wired us in such a way. But we also have to have that line, that signal that tells us when we have enough of other, of other things. Having a line tells us we've had enough, that there is a spiritual or emotional or physical limit to what we want. You know, God puts a line. What are the lines? Well, there are commandments, right? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. There's a line there. You can enjoy your wife. You can be intimate with your wife. You can know your wife as much as a woman can be known. But then there's a line there that God has said, yes, your wife but you can't desire your neighbor's wife. Because if you cross that line, then you have too much of this thing and you will you know, get into trouble, physically, emotionally, spiritually. God has put these lines everywhere to tell us, this is the line where contentment is. You go beyond this line, you go beyond contentment, and you, you harm yourself. So Paul uses uh, this particular word in this way. Let's go to uh, Philippians, shall we? Chapter four. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content, there's that word, content in whatever circumstances that I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul here says that he has learned to be content. The line and the barrier for Paul was the Lord who provided all of the necessities and protected him against his enemy. He had the thing that enabled him to feel content. And that thing that he had wasn't, I got money in the bank, or I'm, I've got, you know, my partners are each carrying swords and daggers. No, the thing that he had wasn't a thing. It was a person. His line that defined contentment was the Lord himself. He knew and was confident that the Lord would provide for him in all circumstances, therefore allowing him to feel content in all circumstances. If he had a lot, he could say, praise God, God has provided, you know, the line is really far out there. Praise God. And if he didn't have a lot, well, praise God. The, law, the line is right here, it's right close by. The Lord must believe that I can make it with what he has provided at this moment. His faith in God enabled him to feel content. Not how much stuff he had, it was who he had. The Hebrew writer also echoes this idea in Hebrews 13, verse five. He says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Here the warning is against the sin of greed for money. But the line that circles and protects against this is the knowledge that God will always provide, thus establishing the possibility for contentment. So what's greed? Well, greed is having no limit. There's no limit in your life. There's no line anywhere on anything. You just want more. More money, more power, more free time, more leisure time, more sex, more, 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 more. There's no line anywhere to tell you, okay, the, you know, you've arrived at full. And the thing I've noticed about greedy people is they, they're never happy. They're never, they're never happy because they don't know where the line is. The way to draw that line, uh, to raise that barrier, if you wish, against greed and dissatisfaction is to contemplate the good that is in our lives and acknowledge God as the source and provider for all that we need through praise and through gratitude. 
there is a, a direct, if unseen, relationship between the amount of praise and thanksgiving we express and the degree of contentment that we experience. There's a link between the two. If in my own personal spiritual life I'm beginning to feel spiritually uncomfortable, dry, sad, you know, so on and so forth, uh, the remedy for me personally is to begin enumerating the blessings that exist in my life. Not the stuff I want to have, the things that I actually have and simply begin to offer praise to God for the things that I possess already in my life. Not prayers to ask Him to supply the things that are missing, but rather prayers and praise to acknowledge the things that I have from Him. And that, after not a very long time, that begins to lift my spirit and enable me personally to begin to see things in perspective. One other note that I might share with you on a personal basis is I have never been able to exhaust the things that I have from Him. I, I kind of wear out. Okay, I, I guess you understand, Lord, that I'm appreciative of all these things, but there's so much stuff for me to give thanks for. I think it's supper time, I got to go. because you can never, ever enumerate everything that He's given you, given me, too much. Paul said that he had learned, remember in that passage in Philippians? He had learned to be content, and I am persuaded that this education was provided for the most part as he persevered in praise and thanksgiving while suffering persecution, while suffering rejection and disappointment and imprisonment for the cause of Christ. He learned about, notice he said he learned how to be content. There's a learning curve. And how did he learn it? He persevered in contemplating what he had and praising God for what he had. He persevered in understanding where the line was in every area of his, of his life in order to understand and to experience contentment. Well, both Canada and the United States give thanks at this time of year, and well they should. The line, the circle that we have established to measure our contentment is firmly secure. In North America, despite recent economic troubles, in spite the news and the bombings and all that business that is taken care of, we still, we still are the most wealthy nation in the world. We still are the most comfortable nation in the world. When I say comfortable, I don't just mean that as an as a, you know, esoteric idea. I mean comfortable, physically comfortable. You should see the hotel we stayed in in Europe. I'm, I, we didn't stay in any flea trap or anything like that. They were clean, but I want to tell you, you don't get a lot of space. Those of you who've traveled, right, Grace? You don't get a, a juice, rather. you don't get a lot of space. We were in, a, we were in this hotel and it was, you know, we were paying a lot of money for this hotel. I forget what, a couple of two, three hundred dollars a night, was that it? Whatever, something like that. There's nothing else available. And I mean, if it was what, 10 by 11? That was the size of the room. The bathroom was just a bit bigger than the bathroom that's on a plane. You're laughing, I'm not kidding you. The houses were jammed, especially in London, the houses were just jammed together, one on top of the other and so on and so forth. We are, we are and, and London is a you know, modern city. Here, you know, wow, you want a half acre? 6,000 bucks or something. You know, there a half acre, six million dollars, nobody you know what I'm saying? We're, we're the most comfortable. Our dollar buys so much more. I just give you one little thing. We went into a McDonald's. Did I say this this morning? We went into a McDonald's. We had two Big Macs, medium fry, medium drink, and two quarter pounders, medium fry, medium drink, no refill, $52. $52. I said, no toy. Right, no toy. 
And I was there, I was eating my burger, you know, and I was thinking, I could have gone to Santa Fe Steakhouse and had me a ribeye that big. And they'd give me a bag to bring home the rest and I could eat tomorrow and the next day. 52 bucks for. So we are the, the most comfortable, we are the most secure. We are the most. Could something bad happen? Sure, but man, they're going to have to really work at it. They're going to have to work at it. We give thanks here in this country because we really do have everything. We really do have everything. And you know what? Unfortunately, everything is what we want. We haven't really learned how to do without. So as Christians, let's not only rejoice over the momentary prosperity of our respective nations. As I say, a brief glance at history teaches us, you know, nations, they rise, but they also fall. There's nothing about America here, brothers and sisters, nothing about Canada that, that cannot, you know, that guards it against failure, total failures, nothing about that. God raised us up and God can bring us down. As Christians, however, let's focus uh, our thanksgiving on this day and other days like it uh, on our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the focus of our thanksgiving. That's where it should be. Let's contemplate His word and His promise never to abandon us and one day return to bring us to heaven with Him forever. The, you know, there's something about being a Christian and living in the United States that I continually say to myself, man, I get this here and now, and heaven too. And heaven too. I think of my brothers and sisters living in Haiti in a cardboard box somewhere who go to church like we go to church and they praise God like we praise God and they confess Christ and are baptized in His name for salvation, but then at the end of the service they go back home to a cardboard box or a shack somewhere. And their children have meat twice a week. And yet I call them brother and they call me brother. And they're looking forward to heaven, but I'll tell you something, they're looking forward to heaven a lot more than I'm looking forward to heaven. Because you see, I got all of this and then I get to go to heaven too. You know, to whom much is given? That's us, folks. That's us. Nobody, no one in history has been, have been given what, what we've been given. So let us contemplate our Lord Jesus. Let's keep our mind focused on Him. And let us celebrate through praise and thankful prayer the many physical and spiritual blessings that He provides each day. And why? For our joy. You think you're unusual as a parent that, uh, excuse me, we think we're unusual as parents because we want to give good things to our children. But God wants to give good things to His children too. He wants us to enjoy and to rejoice in all that He gives us. And in return, acknowledge the source of our blessings. Not as, okay, thank you very much, what else do you want? Not that attitude, that attitude, thank you, Lord. I have so much, Lord, it's just overflowing. You know? Thank you, you're so good to me. He's giving us what we have so that we can be happy and rejoice with Him, that's why. And let us make Jesus the line and the circle around our lives so that having and knowing the Lord becomes the very substance of what it means to be satisfied, to be filled, regardless of what we possess materially. Isn't that what David the psalmist says? That the Lord is the portion of His cup, meaning, Lord, you're my gift. Father, your, your presence in my life, this is the best thing that I have. What I want more of, and this is my, what my wife tells me all the time, if I'm you know, getting a little funky, she says, you know, Michael, what you need is more of Jesus today. You need more of Jesus today. 
And I think all of us should say that to one another. I need more of Jesus today, not more of the world. You know, if I were running for president, and who isn't these days, <laughs> and I won the election, one of the first things that I would do is change the generic name of this holiday from Thanksgiving Day to let us celebrate God Day. Or let us give thanks to Jesus Day or week. Of course, this is not as catchy a title, you know, a little bulky on greeting cards, probably violating somebody's rights somewhere. But this name would be more accurate because everything good that we receive comes from God. And everything that comes from God is worth celebrating. Because in our lives and in our society, we celebrate the most worthless things. Because some actor has come down with a disease transmitted to him sexually, he gets to be a star for a day. Everybody wants to know his story. We celebrate him. What kind of nonsense is that? And yet to celebrate the giver of life, oh no, we couldn't, we couldn't say that in public, on television, yeah, it's good if you say it in your church buildings, but don't even say that in a, on television or on the radio. You might hurt somebody's feelings. If I were the president, God in Christ would receive the glory and the thanks and the respect only He deserves for all of the blessings we enjoy in this and in every generation. But alas, I, I'm not the commander in chief and you are not Congress and we cannot legislate such a thing. So let us in our own lives, therefore, celebrate God each day for all He has given us in Christ, not just the fourth Thursday in November. Of course, our most precious blessing is the salvation freely offered to those who believe and obey Jesus' command to repent and be baptized in His name. And for those who have the blessing of salvation, it becomes the source of great thanksgiving and peace of mind and joy. Isn't that the thing you say thank you for the most? You know, before my eyes close and before I drift off into sleep every single night, it's the thing that I thank Him for. Dear Lord, if this is the last night of my life, thank you for the life you've given me and I look forward to being in your arms when I awake. That's the kind of prayer that I want everybody in this congregation to be able to say with a clear conscience and a pure heart. So if you've not already done so, I do encourage you tonight as we have the opportunity to come forward and confess Christ or be restored to Christ if you've wandered away, that you might have peace of mind and that you might give, celebrate, contemplate, find contentment in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Shall we stand and sing this song of invitation and contemplate the invitation?